It's Live in the Bream with host of Fox News at Night, Shannon Bream. This week on Living the Brain, we have all kinds of news of the day to talk about, but a very special event that we want all of you to get involved with as well. And more, Chief Political Anchor, Brett Baer, you know him, you love him, New York Times bestseller, among many other things, world-class golfer. I feel like I can, <laughs> I can, you know, legitimately throw that in there as well. <laughs> welcome to Living the Brain. Hey, good to be here. Okay, I don't even know where to start right now. As we are talking, it is Tuesday. We are still swirling in the early days of the Biden administration. A lot of executive Mm -hmm. orders. This is something that both parties have been critical of each other doing, but it is the quickest way for a new president to get things done, especially if they don't feel confident that they can move Congress on some of the big things they want to move. Uh, Anything that stands out to you so far? Well, I think uh, some of the COVID things, you know, trying to to get a handle on um, the distribution of vaccines, um, the mask wearing. But I think the one that really kind of raised eyebrows was racial equity. One would think that we had it, you know, largely with federal um, regulation and and how each agency is set up. But it's almost like a, a different level something he campaigned on, but we don't really know what it means as far as implementation in housing and urban development. So essentially it means you couldn't discriminate against anybody, but that's already in federal law. So I'm your lawyer. I I don't, Mm -hmm. I think it's more symbolic, but sometimes these things, once you have an executive action, open doors to regulations that we don't even know about yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much of that happens because we know the regulatory or administrative state has so much power of people that are unelected. Um, They are bureaucrats who are doing important work, but they do get an enormous amount of power when they're given this regulatory authority. One of the things that seems to be getting a lot of attention as well that has concrete impact is the decision to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, We heard from Alaska's governor on our show last night, a number of West Coast or Western um, governors and senators and representatives speaking out about this because these are real world impacts for them, for jobs, for industries that built up around the pipeline that we heard from a Native American tribe yesterday that said, you're actually hurting our ability to be um, self-determining and a lot of the jobs that we have around here too. Um, And, you know, the critique I read this morning said it's a gift to Russia. So a lot of critiquing of the Keystone decision. Yeah, and I think you heard from the Canadian Prime Minister uh, weighing in, Justin Trudeau, uh, saying that he was disappointed in that action. Um, and I think, listen, there are other things that are going to come out, these permits and, and gas um, permits that will be taken away, essentially, uh, stopped, um, is something that we talked about prior to uh, Pennsylvania and uh, the concerns in, in a state like Pennsylvania where that matters. And um, I think, you know, these are all things talked about on the campaign trail, but eventually they're going to be uh, in reality in, in federal regulation, and, um, and that will change things. And in, with a, a very slim majority in the Senate and the House, uh, 2022, you know, you start to kind of frame what that looks like, depending on what happens now. Mm -hmm. So they're about the business now of putting together the Biden administration formally, and there's a lot of talk of division and how the parties are, you know, evenly split in the Senate, but with Vice President Harris as the deciding vote, Democrats obviously have the advantage there in the Senate, but business still goes on. I mean, we're getting cabinet secretaries approved, important positions are getting filled. Does that speak to you that, listen, these guys who've been around a long time, like Senator McConnell, like Senator Schumer, they know there's work to be done. And as much as there may be fighting out there on Twitter and elsewhere, they are getting some actual work done. Yeah. You know, I don't think any of these big positions are in jeopardy. Uh, You know, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, Treasury at Janet Yellen, those votes are, you know, 80 to 20, Mm -hmm. sort of uh, kind of round about those numbers. So I think each administration gets some leeway as far as uh, the people, as long as they're they're not uh, out on on an extreme. I do think that you're going to see much more contention on some of the big issues Mm -hmm. because of the decision of Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema to say we are not for blowing up the filibuster. And by doing that, uh, that takes away the ability to do that for Chuck Schumer, and it gives Mitch McConnell much more power on legislation uh, to block it. 
Mm -hmm. So let's talk about filibuster so people understand normally now to get something moving in the Senate on most big pieces of legislation, you have to get 60 votes just to get to the consideration of it. Even if Democrats have 51 votes, um, they can't just move through anything they want unless they get rid of that filibuster. And there's a lot of talk about what they could do if they got rid of the filibuster. Um, You know, statehood uh, becomes easier for places like D.C. and Puerto Rico and other territories. Could they start packing the Supreme Court? Could they add seats? Could they um, any number of things where they would just have a lot more leeway if they only need to get to 51? How steady do you think the promises are? You've talked many times with Senator Manchin. We had Senator Cinema come out yesterday, as you noted, and say this is, position is not debatable. I don't think it's good for the Senate to get rid of the filibuster. How solid do you think those positions are? I think they're pretty solid. I mean, I think, you know, you look, look at the statements. Um, I've had Senator Manchin on and it's been pretty clear about where he is. Uh, Cinema's statement on it was pretty clear. And um, I think you could even get a couple more senators who feel that way about the process, about keeping the the tradition of the Senate um, and not doing away with the filibuster. It protects the right of the minority. Um, however, you know, there's a lot of push. I mean, Eric Holder, former attorney general, is out uh, calling for the court packing, if mm-hmm. you will, to really happen. And you have statehood push from D.C. and Puerto Rico. I don't think those are going to happen because I think that the the Democrats who've come out, Manchin and Cinema, are going to be joined by a couple others uh, on process. And that, that, I think, is what convinced McConnell to move forward with the power sharing deal he's done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to the big story that we are days away from now as it continues to bubble is impeachment. Uh, As you and I talk, Senator Rand Paul is trying to offer up a procedural move that would block it from going anywhere. Um, I've heard a number of others, I'm sure you have potential actions that senators could take to stop this thing before it really starts. But it looks absent um, something unexpected that start February 9th in earnest, this thing is going to be public. We're going to start with the arguments uh, against now former President Trump being removed from office. And there are scholars on both sides of this who say it's completely unconstitutional and ridiculous. It was meant to get rid of an official. He's already gone. Others who will say, no, there have been unique circumstances in the past where somebody who's already gone from office has actually been tried. It sounds like the trial is happening. Yeah, I think trial is going to happen. Whether it falls flat and they don't basically have the 17 votes uh, to convict, I think um, is probably a safe bet, at least now. Um, I do think that there's going to be a constitutional play. Rand Paul and others are making that uh, to say that he's already out of office. And um, But there's a flip side. The Federalist Society, others have come out saying um, that it is constitutional. So I think that that's going to be uh, – that'll be argued – the bottom line is that the actions that he was impeached, when he was impeached, uh, he was present. And so now that there's this delay to when the trial happens, a lot of people are going to talk about process, but Democrats want to focus on the substance of the charge and the article of impeachment of incitement of that mob. Yeah, and I've heard from a number of uh, Republicans, as I'm sure you have too, who say, I don't approve of this behavior at all. I've called him out publicly and privately. I think it was absolutely wrong and disastrous. But I don't think this proceeding is legit. So I'm going to vote no, not because I don't think he bears zero culpability, but because I don't think the way in which the House and the Senate, the Democrats are handling this is actually going to be legitimate and or help the country. Um, You know, there's some concern, I think, among Democrats that this could end up making former President Trump more empathetic to people who feel like you are just piling on. The guy is gone. Um, If you're going to waste this time going after him and holding this big trial, it's a bit of a show, and you're actually going to, among some people, potentially engender some sympathy for him. I agree, and that is a political calculation that Democrats have to make, and they're making. They're saying, um, you know, we think it's valuable to go forward on principle here. Uh, I I think Republicans are going to argue two fronts. One is the constitutionality of of kicking out a president who's already left office, but also on the process in the House, which is traditionally a grand jury, uh, and it has a committee hearing that is like a grand jury. Uh, That didn't happen. This was a straight up or down vote. And when you look at that, um, I think there'll be legitimate challenges to whether it was fair to the president's defense. 
So looking ahead, uh, obviously there are some who, it seems like a long shot to get to conviction. You're going to have to have at least 17 Republicans, assuming all Democrats stick together, to come over to that side. I don't think the numbers are there right now. Um, listen, nothing can surprise us. And I would say 2020 because it's still continuing into. For the full podcast, go to foxnewspodcast.com.